And now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Doug Chase. He graduated from the University of Pacific School of Dentistry in 1979 and practiced general dentistry along with obstructive sleep apnea, along with other disorders for over 40 years. He speaks regularly, domestically, and internationally, and actually is hopping on a plane right after this talk, um, after a little bit of refreshments, I hope, and will be headed to Seattle for a talk there. Please join me in welcoming Doug Chase. you guys where this all came from. So this photo was, was in 1966 before this building was built. And I want to uh, particularly make you uh, aware of, this is the, the actual site, but if you'll particularly take a look at this poster, a billboard. And so now that is that same poster with some people in front of it in 1966. So the Scoys was just a dream at that point. But it became staffed and it became filled with residents such as yourselves that made a community a really, really uh, important one in this city and certainly one that's uh, nationally recognized. I lecture all over the place and the Sequoias is one of the top. Uh, and I, I've been an advising uh, dentist for a half a dozen or a dozen um, facilities that deal with the population and, and yours is really a really I want to thank Allison Short. Carletta, Monet's, and these, uh, for putting together these wonderful lecture programs. It's really you know, a great asset to your community. Today's lecture is going to involve a number of topics, all revolving around one issue, and that is sleep apnea. So we're going to talk about what it is, the society damage that it causes, the systemic damage that it causes to the individual, such as yourself, if you have this, the diagnosis or the lack of diagnosis that we find it in the uh, medical community, the types of treatments that are possible for this, as well as uh, a little bit of Q and A at the very end. So you know, if I had a pill to give you that could lengthen your life, improve your memory, strengthen your immune system, improve your relationships, reduce your risk of heart attack, fatigue, diabetes, you know, would you want to buy it? I think you all would. Uh, well, I don't have the pill, but I do have a solution that affects 20% of you, and if you add insomnia to it, probably 50% of you in this room. So sleep apnea. So this kitty has sleep apnea. shapes and forms that are not conducive to good airway. Uh, additionally, they live in an environment that is also full of uh, antigens and uh, inflammatory issues that contribute to uh, upper airway passage problems. So it's an industrialized environment that creates the, the footing and the foundation for sleep apnea. So going away from a cat to a person, Or more. And the second is 
hypotenias, which means you're breathing, but not very well. You're dragging in the air. So if you stop breathing for 10 seconds or more, you have had an apneic event. And if you are having a hypotonia, it means if you drop 4% in oxygen saturation, the computer will also click off that you had a hypotonic event. You can add these events together, and you get apnea hypotonia index. And this is a way, this is one of the main indexes, indices that which they diagnose whether or not you have sleep apnea. Uh, physiologically, what's going on, if you're trying to get air that comes through, you're kind of having air that goes, you want the air to come in, continue on down into the lungs. What happens for the majority of people with sleep apnea is it's contributed, in fact, that's why they call it obstructive sleep apnea, is the tongue musculature falls back into the throat and blocks the airway. And after a period of not breathing, you gasp, tongue comes out of the airway, and you breathe. Well, how come if in nature this doesn't happen, why are we having it? Well, it's because of the way our heads are formed as little children. So this is a developmental issue. It is not one that comes just casually because of our evolution. We are creating our own environment that contributes to the development of sleep apnea. So the tongue stays in the way, the air cannot get in or out, the brain then sets off a cascade of biochemistry and neuroelectrical activity to then create the lungs to open up, along with all the biochemicals that are released because of the fear that you're literally dying as it goes along. How they test for this is with a polysomnogram. And this is a um, And this is a, uh, a device that's worn in a clinic that you can get all the data, your snoring, your breathing, your desaturation, meaning how low your oxygen levels are going, your effort, are you actually trying to breathe or not, your electrical brain activity, are you in a light sleep, a deep sleep, are you awake, and so on. And all that data then goes in to create the statistics that then they look at, the information they look at to whether or not to decide whether or not you have sleep out there or any one of the over 100 sleep breathing disorders. So when you go into a clinic for, to be tested for sleep apnea, they're testing for a variety of issues. The predominant ones are insomnia and sleep apnea, which contribute to 50% of all sleep breathing disorders. But there are parasomnias and narcolepsy and restless leg syndrome and peripheral leg syndrome. There's a variety of issues that they do test for. Additionally, you can have home devices. They're much simpler. And the computerization, the miniaturization of these testing equipment have gotten quite good. Some of the major medical um, insurances are driven using home testing. So you don't have to go hang out in a medical hotel room, so to speak, uh, with video cameras on you in the middle of the night, checking you out to see whether or not you're breathing properly. You can do this in the comfort of your home. And in fact, in my practice, although I don't diagnose it, we certainly provided patients on a regular basis to take the equipment home and get tested and then we send the data to clinics. You can even do this on the internet now. Uh, you can actually go online and you can order and they will send you the equipment in the mail and you will hook it up, have a sleep, mail it all back to them. They will have doctors on staff that will download the information, put it up on their computer and tell you what's going on as far as your sleep patterns and what's going on. Contributing to having uh, problems. So, as I mentioned, you know, normal blood saturation, um, you need to be highly saturated with oxygen. Right now, in the majority of us, we should be at 99, 100% saturated, meaning there's enough oxygen in your blood that essentially your blood can't carry anymore. That's roughly 100%, 99%. If you have emphysema, if you have other issues that are creating a drag on your ability to oxygenate, then your, your uh, oxygen levels will drop. So as you're sitting there breathing, you're going in and out, in and out, what I want to do is, as you expire, you let the air go out, I want you to 
stop. Don't breathe in, don't breathe out, just stop. Hold it. Okay. Uncomfortable, huh? That's that's on the low end of average of an athletic <laughs> event. Most athletic events are 20 to 30 seconds long, and they're not where you go <gasps> and hold your breath for the 30 seconds. You're breathing very shallowly, and then and you're stuck for 20 to 30 seconds. It's really hard to have a drop of two or three percent. What you just did may have dropped maybe one percent of your oxygen for that moment in time. It is very hard to drop two, three, four percent, and that's what's the triggering in the computers to say that you have sleep apnea. So it is a big drop in oxygenation. And I, I've seen people that have oxygen levels that you, you think they're just going to be dead. They're in their 80s, 80 percentile, 85 percent. Amazingly low, and they're still alive. But it is taking its toll. And we'll talk about that. Traditionally, in this day and age, they have um, home over-the-counter gadgets to diagnose. Uh, and you, iPhones and the, uh, smartphones will allow you to download app apps and they can tell you, you can wear it with Fitbit and other types of wrist monitors and they'll tell you whether or not you have activity if you're turning over and so on and so forth. I'm here to tell you they don't work. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't do this. They're going off very circumstantial information. The fact that you're not moving doesn't mean that you're in REM sleep. It can very easily mean that you're daydreaming, that you're just awake. Right? So it can't tell you this. Um, it's a very primitive way of looking at it. Even though, you know, the graphs and everything that they create on these phone screens looks really impressive. <laughs> Bottom line is that's not, that's not the way you're going to find out if you have a problem. So as I get into the damage uh, uh, from a societal point of view, one thing that I do want to say is, is I'm going to be kind of inflammatory here because it's a really bad disease. And in this room, over 20%, conservatively over 20% of you have sleep apnea. We had insomnia to this group based on your demographics. Almost half, and conservatively almost half, have insomnia or sleep apnea. But even though I'm saying that, I'm not saying that sleep apnea is the cause of all physiological damage in the world. It's just that it's a major player, and it's highly und undiagnosed. Over 80% is not diagnosed. So we end up with societal issues that are just barely scratching the surface as far as what's happening. So the NTSB uh, uh, has a list of crashes that they've attributed to sleep apnea. For instance, the one at the New Jersey Transit train that crashed into the Hoboken Terminal. You may have seen the video for that. It was pretty impressive. The Long Island Rail one in New York that crashed uh, last year. And then, of course, then there's this one. I'm not sure we'll hear the video. I'm just by those faces. Rockefeller told federal investigators that he fell into a trend moments before his train hurtled into a sharp curve at 80 miles per hour. Four people died that day. Sixty were injured. It was later determined that Rockefeller suffered from an undiagnosed case of severe sleep apnea. See, so here it's on the news. It comes and then it goes. There's no rules. There's no call out for action. And, you know, and this is just three of them in the last two years. Um, and it's not just on the ground. We have stuff going on in the air as well. So the FAA notes dozens of fatal airline crashes due to sleep apnea. And everything I say in here, if it's written up on here, you can Google this and you can find these same studies. Okay? I don't list the studies and the dates, but it's all there. I'm not just putting out opinions here. Um, one that was a classic one uh, three, uh, some years ago was an airliner that flew towards Hilo Missed the island, went right over it, kept on going out into the Pacific. And it took a while before the stewardesses realized, wait a minute. And so they're banging on the door to get the pilots awake. Not just the primary pilot, but the second in command was also asleep. And it took them 18 minutes to, to get them awake and get turned around. Not good. So the uh, uh, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration says that over 25% of truckers have sleep apnea. 
and a study that finds that over 50% of truck drivers snore, and that 40% of commercial drivers likely have sleep apnea. So you fall asleep, bad things happen. And then we have the, the sleepy driver and the relationship in this uh, study from Harvard that said that auto accidents more than double when you have sleep apnea. And both sleepy driving and drunk driving contribute to over 100,000 accidents each year. So it's in the same, it's in the same league as driving drunk. And the uh, Journal of Internal Medicine found that sleepiness while driving carried almost as the same uh, risk as having uh, being intoxicated. Well, so how common is sleep apnea? As I mentioned, in this room, it's very common because once you get past your 50s and 60s, it, the, the rate goes up considerably. But even if we look at a low rate in, in age, 30 to 39, for women, we're talking about 7 8%. For men, we're talking about 16%. Get into your midlife here, and you're getting about, for men, you're getting into 20, 20% plus, and you're getting into the high teens for women. And it goes up as we go along. Now, what I'm going to talk about a little later is the difference between men and women. And all of you say, well, it's a far greater problem for men than women. OK, in strict numbers. But in actual damage, um, women sometimes take the brunt of it, uh, which is interesting talk about. So I mentioned about the damage that it does to you physiologically, to the individual. And this is an interesting graph. And again, you can look these up on the internet. But if you have, say, diabetes, 72% of those people with diabetes, but 72% of the people with sleep apnea have diabetes. Whereas diabetes in the general population is what, 5, 8%, 10%, something like that. If you have a nighttime heart attack, it's almost a given that it happened that you have sleep apnea. So when you hear on the news somebody died in their sleep, first of all, more than likely they had sleep apnea. And number two, as I've already kind of described to you, sleep apnea is not dying peacefully in your sleep. It is, a, it is rough. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now one of these um, items is one that I focused in on, and that was atrial fibrillation, uh, which is a beating of the heart manner that's not conducive to good rhythm. So 50% roughly of people with atrial fibrillation have sleep apnea. And I can tell you right now that a big part of those people, a big percentage of those people, if they got their sleep apnea diagnosed and treated, they would not have their atrial fibrillation. It's as simple as that. And I can't tell you how many people over the decades I've had come in and they have sleep apnea, or they think they have sleep apnea. You diagnose it, and the next thing you know, we're finding out they have a fit. Um, so you get the pacemaker, which kind of, it's that problem of the doctors look at the, you know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you have a nail, you look for a hammer. And the hammer's the doctor, and the nail is whatever you go into them with. Let's say it's diabetes. Let's say it's atrial fibrillation. So they have a solution for that. And that's wonderful that they do. They put, go and put a pacemaker in there. Good for them. And it fixed your, 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 your uh, atrial fibrillation. But it didn't fix the overall global issue of what was causing that atrial fibrillation, which was the sleep apnea. And so you fixed that by putting one finger in the dike. Meanwhile, your blood glucose is going off the charge. You're having heart issues and hypertension. You, all these other things that are happening because you didn't fix the primary problem, which is the sleep apnea. There's a variety of issues that come across from sleep apnea. These are some of the issues that we see. One with uh, dementia is one that's really interesting, and there's a new study, I'll, I'll mention this a little bit. But one that's very common that I see all the time, and that is uh, esophageal reflux, GERD. Three-fourths of the people that have GERD have sleep apnea. And it kind of makes sense. You're laying down on your back, you're asleep, you're gasping and trying to so your diaphragm is just kicking up all over the place. And your diaphragm sits just below your stomach. And so you're just pushing that stomach all around, and you're pushing against these pyloric sphincters. And so eventually what happens, you start getting reflux. It starts to break down and push through. And 
so quite often people will be taking again. The medical doctor say, hey, you have GERD. We're going to give you pills you know, to stop the acid reflux. Okay, and they kind of do. But they didn't get at the core of the problem, which was sleep apnea. So you fix the sleep apnea and a lot of the GERD will go away. You're five times more likely to die from cardiac related deaths for untreated sleep apnea than those that didn't have sleep apnea. It's common to have, much more frequent to have depression, anxiety, three times more likely to have dementia with those that have sleep apnea. We're going to talk about that as a separate study. So this study just came out literally a week ago or so, uh, although it was uh, published in uh, late September, September 25th. And this is a really interesting one because this is something that happens before you have the dementia. So they did a study of a couple thousand people over 18 years, and the Journal of Sleep is a highly recognized uh, authority, and they did this study of a couple thousand people over 18 years and said, if you have daytime sleepiness and napping, you had a two and a half times odds of having more beta amyloid de de deposited. And beta amyloid is one of the main culprits that they're attributing to the formation of de uh, uh, the creation of setting the stage for dementia and Alzheimer's. So here was an easy test. An easy test is when you go to the doctor and say, so, are you sleeping during the day when you don't want to be sleeping? Do you nap when you really don't want to take a nap? You know, for someone who's 30, 40, 50 years old, if that's the answer is yes, then they're highly at risk of having the sleep apnea, and more importantly, having a risk of having dementia being much more likely to be occurring. Fascinating study. Obviously, it needs more support, but uh, yeah, with more studies, but it's an interesting way to, to screen for it. My screening, one of my simplest screening tools when I would get patients to come in, they, for whatever reason they thought they had, might not sleep out, and I'd say, do you protect your sleep? People who have normal sleep, they go, what? Protect my sleep? They say, yeah. And I just let it leave. Well, they'll go, well, I need to sleep. Okay. And that's about it. But when you ask somebody who has a sleep breathing disorder and they're not getting enough sleep, even though they may be in bed for enough hours, they will almost always, they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, I, I have to really, I need this many hours or I don't feel good. I, I have to, you know, I protect my sleep. I need this much time. I can't go Sunday night. I can't go out because I have to work early Monday morning and you know I just won't be up to it if I don't get so many hours of sleep. They're very protective of their sleep. I should know. I have sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. I've had it for a decade. I knew I was going to get it before I even got it, because I have a physiology. My physiology is a long, narrow face, crowded arch. They removed teeth orthodontically. They didn't spread out my arch and give me more room. Instead, they pulled everything in to make me look, give me a nice smile. It created less tongue space. So where's the tongue got to go? Small garage, big car, tongue's got to go back. So, so as the years went on, muscle tongue gets lost. You not only get a little bigger neck size on the outside, but you get a smaller lumen, a little airway on the inside. Now the deposits go both directions. And so I've used an oral appliance for about, uh, well, about 10 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> there was an 18 year follow up of 1,500 uh, participants in a Wisconsin sleep cohort study. So it was established in 1988 and it involved a random sample of men and women from a community who were between the ages of 30 and 60. And the study began 18 years earlier. So when they finished that study, their conclusion was that you are four times more likely to die from any cause than those that do not have sleep now. So is there anything worse than waking up to go to the bathroom? Well, not waking up. <laughs> so, so I guess you understand the topic here. Uh, sleep apnea connects to 60% increase in the, in the presence of chronic kidney disease. There's a lot of biochemistry here that goes on. This is 
this is not a simplistic point of view of how this works, but when you, when you have sleep apnea, you affect two different levels of physiological function. One, you affect the mental capability. So if you don't get a recuperative sleep, your brain isn't going to work well. So you're going to be much more uh, having issues with cognitive function, uh, attention, mm -hmm. um, um, eye-hand coordination, uh, focus, these types of things. But biochemically, it's releasing a host of chemicals that are inflammatory because it's struggling to stay open, to, to breathe. So your inflammatory stress chemicals, your fight or flight mechanism, are kicking into high gear. Why? Because you're dying in your sleep. Your oxygen levels are going down. You're having a physical, it's just like somebody slaps their hand over you for 30 seconds every, how many times in an hour? Well, um, if you have mild sleep apnea, it's about 15. If you're moderate, it's about 30. If you have severe, it can be 50, 60. It means every minute you stop breathing for 20 or 30 seconds. That's half of the time that you're breathing. So you can imagine what your heart rate's doing, the hypertension is kicking off, your cortisol, your adrenaline is kicking in. You are, you are literally, the body is struggling to stay alive every night that this goes on. And so it wears down a lot of the physical components of your body, the heart and so on. But physiologically, it also releases a lot of biochemicals that affect other organ systems, and one of them is the kidneys. So bed buddy is a, is a consequence of that. Both the physicality of it, because you're not waking up, you're sleepy, but also because of biochemistry. Talk about that. In children, you know, you can almost bet on it. And I, can, you know, I, I, I taught at a university for half a dozen years, and from time to time, the clinic would have these kids that would come in, and they would be coming in because of their sleep apnea or other issues. And we would always have these questionnaires and stuff. And when we saw this kid, who was nine or ten years old, and they had bedwetting, and of course, they're feeling like they're, they're seeing a psychologist on all the other issues. We hope this felt more than likely the kid has sleep apnea. And you treat the sleep apnea, and the bedwetting goes away. Um, pretty much universal for that. So if there's snoring occurring, there's almost a four time increase if the kid has sleep apnea. Hmm. The statistics are you know, this is an interesting population right here because you know you're kind of balanced. There's almost equal numbers of men and women in this room. It's really interesting because as we get older, men, you know, we tend to die off and women tend to be the survivors. And, and you know why? Because women take care of themselves. When something's going wrong, they go see a physician. Men, not so much. So we end up catching things much later in the game. Not to mention risky behavior um, that uh, kills off a younger men at a higher proportion. Anyway, for bedwetting among 3,000 postmenopausal women in a study, uh, the risk factors of having a BMI of greater than 30, um, in a simplistic way you're overweight, um, snoring, restless sleep, waking up greater than three times a night, hypertension or daytime sleepiness. If you take just one, take one of those, you, the first one, you go up by just you know, barely uh, a, 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 a 0.3 of 8%. If you go up with two, if you have a BMI and your snore, you, you essentially double up, you're double the baseline. And if you have all of these, if, you are, if you're heavy, if you snore, have restless, you wake up, have some high blood pressure, and you're sleepy, you have a seven times chance that you're going to be having um, bed wetting as an issue. It's almost a given. So on the bright side, you, know, you don't have to work home. But, it does get worse. It does get worse. The brain chemistry, as I alluded to, changes dramatically with people who have sleep apnea. It affects everything from your immunity to your resistance to cancer. All sorts of types of uh, uh, factors come into play um, that are modulating the various functions in your body and the various organ systems that are going on. Uh, for starters, there is a, uh, a delay in the sleep hormone, melatonin, which Increases problems of attention and, and focus. And they noted that almost three fourths of adults and children that have ADHD also have problems with their sleep. Not just sleep apnea, but insomnia and other issues. It changes the chemistry. There's a disruption of circadian rhythms that affect um, more than the melatonin, and there's these electrochemical disruptions that damages creativity, problem solving, and slows down your reaction. Sleep apnea. 
There's an area of the brain where there's what is called mammillary bodies, and they are 20% smaller with those people that have sleep apnea. And that causes trouble in converting short-term memories into long-term. We have the control here, this little kind of two little uh, marbles. Those marbles are much smaller here than somebody who has sleep apnea. So you get impaired uh, memory and recall. You don't consolidate, you don't store the experiences. It leads to impaired memory formation and forgetfulness. As I mentioned, you have this neurochemical roller coaster that's trying to keep you alive. So the adrenaline kicks up. The GABA, which is trying to drop you down into sleep, is then fought with the adrenaline and cortisol and other inflammatory agents that are trying, chemicals that are trying to wake you up. So you get into this fight or flight mechanism. And so you get the adrenaline and the inflammatory chemicals such as cortisol. So you get a heightened uh, reaction to stress. There's a number of studies that talk about the various mental disorders, such as uh, bipolar, dementia, insomnia, psychosis, uh, and attention deficit syndrome. Uh, with the treatment, uh, they treat the sleep apnea, and four out of the five, the bipolar was the one that was a little, eh, they couldn't, they couldn't isolate whether it actually it did help or not. But of the other four out of those five mental illnesses, if you treated the sleep apnea, their symptoms improved. And again, there's, there's uh, you can call, they, as best they can, it's one thing to say, you feel better, that kind of thing. But they are able to quantify this. There are, t there are exams that can be given to let the, whether or not their psychiatric symptoms are improving. I mentioned that men often uh, have a difference in men versus women. Men quite often will snore, um, waking and gasping. And women, not so much. So it's more subtle. It's a little bit harder for us to know that it's happening. Women tend to have uh, more issues of uh, fatigue, anxiety, and depression that are highly related to sleep apnea. Also, we see greater cortex damage in females, um, which then creates cognitive issues. Um, in pregnancy and menopause, increase the risk of developing uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So the hormone imbalances that are more frequent in women with sleep apnea lead to decreased immunity, and the microbiome in the gut is affected as well. So even your, your digestion is and those with uh, OSA have uh, three times higher rate of ED than those that do not have sleep apnea. And it's actually a disease of listeners, too. So sleep apnea is not just affecting the person who's actually doing the snoring, doing the, the, the gasping, doing the, 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 the random leg movements, doing the peripheral arm movements, flopping around the bed, and so on. But it's a disease of listeners, meaning those that are in the same room, and sometimes even in the next room, uh, will feel the effects and know of it. And in fact, there's been a number of uh, studies, and it's about 30% of couples uh, that sleep together are dissatisfied with their level of intimacy due to snoring or sleep apnea. So it's, it's, a, rough, it's a rough illness. And in fact, in, um, in the United States, a, a trend, a building trend, is in homes that are being built, is to have one master bathroom, two master bedrooms. That's how common the problem is. <laughs> Swinging around to children, so this is a health, healthy child sleep. This is not. So what's the difference? Talk about that. American Sleep as, uh, Apnea Association says as many as 25% of children are uh, diagnosed with attention deficit syndrome and actually have symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, as I mentioned before. So much of their learning and, and behavior problems are a consequence of the chronic fragmented sleep they have. And if you treat them with their sleep apnea, for a lot of these kids, they will become dramatically better. Some will get just done. They're just normal. Other kids, obviously, this is a spectrum. It's not a, a light switch. It's not have or you don't. There are different degrees of it. And so the influence of sleep apnea may be just that. It may be an influence on it. You may not solve it. But certainly, it doesn't hurt to go find out because it's an easy treatment to, to deal with. And it's a whole lot better than the medications and everything else that come as a consequence if you end up with ADHD. Um, they've done a number of studies which are really kind of weird. Um, they've done these, um, in Brazil, they did these IQ studies showed kids that had um, sleep apnea had a, had a difference of IQ of 10 to 20 points, which is kind of weird. 
And then the really interesting thing is when they put those kids through, and they, for them, they had surgery, they had um, tonsillectomies, adenotonsillectomies, um, and tested them a year later, their IQ levels came back up normal with their peer groups. So it was recoverable. So what do you look for for a child that has a possible sleep reading disorder? If you have a grandkid, um, some of you have a great grandkid. So this is a kid with sleep apnea. <laughs> Heart rates are going up, cortisol is re being reduced in buckets, adrenaline is kicking in all over the place. So what are the things you look for? Well, that. I used, I used to tell people, tell uh, parents, I'd say, they go, you know, I don't think he has sleep apnea. I go, yeah? Can you hear him breathe? Yeah, I can hear him breathe, though, can't you? No, you don't hear a kid breathe. Not when they're sleeping. You go into a room, you have to get right down close to him to hear him breathe. If you can hear them breathe, that's a bad sign. <laughs> Certainly, this is way over that. So what do you see with the little children with regard to this? Well, physically, many times you will see these, what we will call shiners, okay? Dark rings around their eyes. They will be um, mouth breathers. They will have um, saliva, they will drool on their pillows, which is a reflection that they're opening their mouth. They're not breathing through their nose. Humans are obligate nasal breathers. That means if everything's healthy, the brain and your evolution says you breathe through your nose, not through your mouth. It's much less efficient to breathe through your mouth, both physically as well as physiologically. In the nose, you not only have the ability to warm the air and filter the air, and you've heard all that, but there are nitric oxide receptors in your nose as well. They measure blood gases. Sure, you've got the same receptors in your lungs, but the air gets in your nose first. So if you're having problems with gas exchanges and something needs to be modulated from your brain, you'll get to know it, your brain will get to know it sooner if you're breathing through your nose rather than through your mouth, which has to go to your lungs. So that's important as well. And you can see he's really trying to breathe through his nose. He's really trying because the body wants to do that. But as the years will go on, it'll stop entirely. <clears throat> Why does he have sleep apnea at this age? Because his tonsils are large. I can almost guarantee you. For children, it's almost always there in large. It's only after they become, uh, after puberty, facial features are fully developed. Now we've got skeletal issues that are a problem, you know, bony issues. It's a much bigger problem to treat, much more difficult to treat. So, snoring, can you hear them breathing? It doesn't have to be loud snoring. Are they mouth breathing? Do they have pauses in their breathing during their sleep? Are they daytime sleepy or are they the reverse? They're too active for their age group. Difficulty with concentration, poor attention span, behavioral issues, poor performance at school, bedwetting. If you have a couple of these issues, I would be suspicious. You've got some sleep apnea going on. Sleep apnea for adults, as I was mentioning, from an index standpoint, you know, you have to be over five. Five to 15 is mild. For a child, two or three, and you're you're, you're done, you're cooked, you have sleep apnea. So it's a much lower threshold for children than it is for adults. And it is so resolvable at this age. And I, one thing I can have you take with you is if you go to your relatives that have little tiny children and you suspect something's going on either from a performance issue they're having with their peers or from a physicality of them and the way they sleep, get them checked, get them checked for their tonsils, and either if they can take care of that with um, nasal sprays and so on to reduce the tonsil size, fine. I'm not saying surgery for everybody, but I'm telling you, if it's a difference between them having sleep apnea and not, take those tonsils out. So we talked a little bit about the sex differences. I'm going to key in on that uh, with regard to women. Uh, women risk for sleep apnea increases significantly as you transition through menopause. So there's a protection of the hormones, estrogen, and resistance to some of the damage that goes on to sleep apnea. We don't see that once you transition through menopause. And if you um, have sleep apnea, it becomes dramatically worse after menopause. So you may have been just mild borderline, then you have menopause and maybe just get a couple 
He did several studies that showed that if you have really tough symptom symptomatology of, of, of menopause with a severe hot flash, you were twice, I mean, twice the risk of having obstructive sleep apnea from those women that only had mild or no hot flashes. So there's something metabolically going on there. You don't even understand it. And as I mentioned earlier, women may experience lesser known symptoms, um, such as headaches, insomnia, uh, depression, anxiety, and, and daytime fatigue. Sleep apnea and insomnia put a, uh, put a person nearly three times the risk for osteoporosis. And this is some fairly new information these days, particularly if you get over the age of 64. And that's insomnia and sleep. Also, uh, and this is a fairly recent study, I think it was this 2017, they were doing uh, some uh, ex MRI studies, and they noticed that women had uh, more regions in the frontal uh, lobe of the cortex were thinner in women with sleep apnea than men, which might explain the cognitive difference. Women tend to be more susceptible to cognitive performance problems than men are. And again, we don't understand, but it probably is a relation to hormonal issues. But it is treatable, as I mentioned. And the three main ways of doing it is the one that I do. There's a variety of oral appliances. Generally speaking, they all have one goal, and that is to get the tongue down and forward. And so, you know, you, you know, for everyone here, put your teeth together and try to snore. It's not that hard. Now, jet your jaw as far forward as it can and try to snore. It's really hard. And that's the way oral appliances work. We're just getting the jaw larger, essentially, by bringing it forward. Tongue musculature is all attached to those bones, and it brings it forward, and you open your airway. So it's a fairly simple thing, although there's a lot of nuances to it. CPAP is also a pretty simple thing. We're just going to strap some scuba gear on you and make you breathe. It's not a friendly, particularly, way of doing it, but it works. It works the lion's share of the time. Uh, oral appliances work about 60 to 80 percent of the time. However, the compliancy is about 90 percent. CPAP works about 90 percent of the time. Compliancy is about 50 percent after a year. So most people with CPAP end up with uh, door stops at the end of the year. The people that it works with, go get them. Stay with it. It's going to change your life. It has already. Uh, but if you can't tolerate them, uh, oral appliances. And frankly, oral appliances as a first line of defense would be the way I would be looking at it. And that's the way it is in Europe. In the United States, insurance driven as we are, and the history of sleep apnea and how it got treated, that 80% of people with sleep apnea end up with prescriptions for um, CPAP. 20% end up with oral appliances when you talk about devices. In Europe, it's the other way around. 80% of people sleep apnea have oral appliances, and only 20% have, or have um, CPAP. There's a variety of surgeries. They're scary bad. Yeah. And most of them will not fix your sleep apnea because they're surgerizing the wrong part. They're surgerizing the nose. They're surgerizing the soft tissue of your palate. This is not where the obstruction is. It's in the tongue muscle shirt. It's falling back into the back of the throat. And I was at the university teaching them, so they now, they've gotten smart, and they say, well, we're going to double down. So we're going to give you what's called surgical packages. So they slice off your soft palate. They, um, uh, they tie up the tongue to the high of the bone to bring it forward. And they break both your jaws and bring it forward to create more space. And we saw these patients in our uh, head and neck facial pain clinic because they had no sleep apnea anymore. Yay. Now they had chronic head pain. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I think I would die an earlier death than to have chronic head pain. <laughs> so then, so the surgeries haven't been too successful, um, but they still do them. And like I say, tonsils for children, go get them. That, that'll help the vast majority of children. Um, and I had, I, I had a surgery for my nose, even though I was treating myself with sleep apnea with oral appliances. Well, why did I do that? Because I wasn't breathing well through my nose. And I know. If I, could, if I could breathe through my nose better, that would be a wonderful thing. It's a good thing. And I know as I get older, bacteria, pneumonia, all these things, if I could be breathing through my nose, that would help a lot. 
So it's a relatively easy procedure for them to go in and simply rotor root your nose. It's not very painful, although it's really weird. Taking that, taking that cotton out after you're done. And you can see cross-site after that. They now have a device that uh, is implantable. It's like a pacemaker. And so they put a device down on your chest inside. It's, in, in, it's implanted like a pacemaker. And they have two leads. One goes down towards the, collar, uh, towards the sternum to uh, analyze whether or not you're actually breathing in or out. And when it senses that you're not, it fires off a little signal, electrical uh, pulse to the diastrics and the hyoid muscles to trigger the tongue and the musculature to contract and open up. So it literally pulls the musculature away, you know, like hitting your, like hitting your knee in the funny bone or something, make your, your muscles twitch. It will make your muscles twitch and open up. Um, okay, if you got to, um, but there's, like I say, there's certainly easier ways to do than that. So it's, it is an interesting solution. It's the first one that's been around in 40 or 50 years. It's something new. But here are some easy things for all of you to, to, to take home with you. Sleep hygiene is something that you all can be helpful in creating better sleep for you, your children, anybody. And that is things that you can do in your world to make it more conducive to have good quality of sleep. And you say, well, can we all sleep normal? No, because we're in an industrialized society and there's a lot of stuff coming at you that isn't trying to do what nature would like to happen. So, how much, how much sleep do you need? Um, well, you need enough to feel energized for the next day and refresh. Pretty simple. So you need to figure out, is that seven hours? Is that eight hours? Is that nine hours? It's not 11 or 12. And the studies have shown actually for people who sleep long periods like that, their mortality rate also goes up. So there's a, there's a window there. There's a framework that's best. And it's typically seven, eight, or nine. You need to figure out your body's natural rhythm. Are you a morning person? Are you a night person? That's OK. You still need to make sure that you're doing it on a regular basis and understanding which one you are and going with that. You need to have a constant sleep schedule. And, and this one's difficult in American society. Back in the day, we did not have electricity. It got dark, you had to go to sleep. You didn't have a choice. So those natural rhythms are evolutionarily in us for hundreds of thousands of years. And they're quite strong until you start turning on electrical devices. So the circadian clock, that wake up and go to sleep cycle, really at the same time of every day, and to, build the, and to build the regularity in all the things that you do. So your meal times, your exercise routines. It's disruptive to, the, to your sleep patterns to exercise at 10 o'clock in the morning one day and 5 o'clock in the evening the next day. You're messing up with biochemical activities that are going on that it goes into your circadian rhythms. Um, your screen time, that means TV, iPhones, iPads. If you're, if you're waking up at night and looking at your screen, you're really messing with the body's biochemical reactions that are going on. It's not a good thing. And of course, we see that so commonly with children, that they will have their iPhones in bed with them. Now getting some sun time uh, going up uh, creates, again, it strengthens the circadian rhythms, gets some melatonin in place. These types of things help with regard to um, those kind of cycles help with your blood pressure, uh, your obviously you know, blood sugars, hormones, weight, all these things are affected by things that can, you can do with regard to sleep hygiene. Keeping the bedroom cool and quiet is a good thing. Do not have pets on your bed. That is just terrible. <laughs> not only disruptive to your physical ability to get disrupted during your sleep, but also you know, allergic reactions. Even if you're not severely allergic, it just has to be enough to kind of create resistance to the flow of air, and it's going to be a problem. And that problem is pretty universal for most adults. So I would much rather, I love animals. I can't tell you how much I love animals, but bottom line is I want to live longer than <laughs> so no alcohol or food, especially sugars, uh, two or three hours before bedtime. You need to process those. You don't want to go to bed with a hot spike glucose level. Again, the brain says, hey, we're up. Let's do something. Meanwhile, the brain is trying to say, no, 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 you're trying to sleep. And it runs into conflict. It becomes disruptive. 
No TV or screen time for several hours before bed. Now, I already talked about the light issue. It messes with your circadian rhythms. But there's also the um, uh, emotional, mental uh, complex that goes on physiological with you when you watch TV or, or, or these types of programs. And that is, your brain evolutionarily does not understand the difference between a scary movie and a deep cut physically in your wrist. It perceives both as a threat and a risk. You respond the same with neither way. So you go to a scary movie, your adrenaline is kicking up, cortisol is happening, hypertension is revving up, your brain is coming alive, GABA is getting depressed, all sorts of biochemical factors are anticipating danger. And you are responding. Your immune system gets depressed, gut motility goes down to the floor because it's affecting and saying, we need the blood to go to certain areas and go away from other areas. And that will happen whether you watch a scary movie or somebody's coming at you with a knife physically. So it can't tell the difference. So when you watch the news, and most of it these days, it has an element of danger. And so you're going to respond to that biochemically. And it takes an hour or two for your brain to break down and come down from it. So if you can, watch the bad news early in the evening. <laughs> even even fun shows tend to rev things up. So just bottom line is, if you can, try to do something else uh, that's more calming and uh, that's more mentally uh, imaginative. If you read a book, that's more imagination. It's more abstract versus seeing it. And it. Take your medications at the same time every day. A lot of medications influence sleep, influence your alertness. No one, you want to have the same pattern night after night, not nights to take them during the day. If you think you have any kind of issue, go and get a physical exam. Now, I'm kind of concerned that I have a sleep problem. They may send you home to sleep, they'll, they'll ask you some questions, and they may give some answer, they may send you home with some equipment, and then change what's at risk. You may have noticed, I didn't even say anything about being fat, hardly at all. Obesity is a really big risk factor. But it's kind of the obvious one. It's kind of the elephant sitting in the room. Okay, we all kind of know that. That's going to be a risk factor for sleep apnea. What I'm saying is, is you don't have to be fat to sleep apnea. As I'm pointing out, you know, I'm six to five and kind of skinny, and I have moderate sleep apnea. So it's not it's not as simple as just being fat. There's a lot of a lot of uh, choices as far as the body's physiology and response to that now sleep apnea. So. To kind of review, we define what sleep apnea is, the society damage that we have, the systemic damage that we have, and the uh, diagnosis and treatments. <laughs> it's a treatable disease. It's responsible for a variety of diseases and contributes to many more. Uh, it's easily screened for, it's easily treated, it affects, as I mentioned, just not the person with the disease, but those that are close to them, around them, so it's snoring, the gasping, and other issues, and consequences of it, attention, uh, focus, other issues. It contributes to lost wages, relationship problems, society damage, um, socioeconomic issues, early death. So I, I, I hope the information I give you may be germane to yourself, and, and frankly, I hope that it's like a seed. I hope it spreads out and you're able to provide information to those that are near and dear to you that may also be at risk for Problem. And sometimes you do have to kind of push on it because medicine does not totally have to speak. You'll find those that really understand it. And, but you'll find a lot that don't have much training in medical school that are just kind of going, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard about that kind of thing. Um, and you just got to push through that because I'm telling you, it's really common and it's really damaging. Um, so it will truly take your breath away. So, <laughs> and here afterwards, if you have questions, Otherwise, thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.